Good morning. Is it still morning? Yes, I am in Houston, Texas. So I'm always looking at the time, but it is morning. And I just want to say first and foremost, welcome. Welcome to this time, to this session. Thank you for um, sharing the good mornings in the chat. If you're willing and able, could you please let me know um, where you're coming from, where you are physically located right now. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit about how you identify um, what, what you do, right? So could you just drop, I have your name, uh, your name is coming up, but also where you're located and how you describe what it is you do or how it is you show up in the world. It's one of, this is interesting because I really like virtual conversations and I can't see you all. So um, I'm missing that piece of the interaction. All right, um, thanks Tiffany for letting me know, for being here as the moderator. I see that there's Christopher and Latanya. Um, oh, Fuquay, Verena, North Carolina. I actually know where that is. My ex-husband is from Raleigh, but he had some friends that lived in Fuquay, Verena. I know, I know, it's random. But thank you for being here. Thank you so much for being here. Um, as we get started um, and we keep going, please just introduce yourself in the chat um, because this is gonna be as interactive as I know to make it um, with this kind of one-way communication. Um, I know that this is not always ideal, but I hope that there is something in our time together today that that um, will be inspiring, uplifting, and hopefully provide some um, hopeful challenge for you, right, as we engage this conversation about radical self-love. So my name is Ros Rosella Ide White, and I go by the moniker of the Love Big Coach. Um, I am based in Houston, Texas, which is home, and for the first time probably in my entire life because of what's happening with COVID, I have not been on a plane in over three or four months. I used to travel basically weekly for work. Um, and so I'm missing that. But the silver lining or the upside of this is that I have been able to really engage in some practices and ways of being and knowing that I have been aware of for such a long time. But just for whatever reason, I would often say, because I didn't have the time, didn't make the time to prioritize. So this has been a season for me of prioritizing my prayer life, my practices, um, and reinvigorating um, the power that the spirit has given me to engage in this work of holistic self-care and self-love. Um, so I am a coach, I am a consultant, I'm a content creator, but more than anything, I call myself a healer, right? I am someone who is interested in nurturing life-giving and justice-seeking love within ourselves and um, with and for others, because I honestly believe that love can change the world, so much so that I wrote a book about it. <laughs> and so my book is called Love Big, The Power of Revolutionary Relationships to Heal the World. Um, and this concept, of love big comes from from my book um, and the why of why I do what I do and how I show up is because I just believe we're worth it I believe being made in the image of the divine of being image bearers of who God is and God's abundant creativity we are worth all the love um, that we can both muster and share with one another. And so again, thank you. If you're here, please introduce yourself in the comments. I wanna know where you're from. I wanna know how you spend your time. I really do hate the question of what you do. So I try to say how you spend your time or how you live out your call. So um, welcome Latanya, Christopher from, is it Xenia, Ohio? Um, Oh, and you're headed to DC um, to attend Howard. Congratulations, Divinity School and, and theology, uh, Seminary was an amazing experience for me, so I hope it is for you. Hello, Jacqueline from Kannapolis, North Carolina. Uh, Janice from Laurel. Um, again, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. So the title of my session is Love Big, The Power of Radical Self-Love for Leaders. And I really appreciated and love um, Dr. Mitzi Smith's presentation um, this morning because I am a womanist, right, and by training. So I'm a practical theologian. 
And so I'm someone who is very much steeped in a tradition of, of theology that is about the practical implications, right? That our understanding of who God is and how God shows up um, has practical implications for our lives. And so I, I operate out of that framework and that framing. And I loved how um, Dr. Smith talked about radical as that which rejects patriarchal and slaveholder paradigms, right? And so we're going to use that as our framing as we talk about then what is radical self-love for leaders. So that which is radical is that which rejects patriarchal and slaveholder paradigms. And we know that which is patriarchal is that which is either male-centered or male-centric, and that which is out of the slaveholder understanding is actually very much connected to our capitalistic way of being. So we are what we produce, or we are the actual um, means and production of labor. And so we're not honored for who we are. We're not honored in our inherent being. We end up being only honored if we produce. And so what I'm gonna talk about is really a reclamation of our humanity, first as ourselves. And secondly, um, when we do that, we're able to reclaim the humanity of those that we are in relationship with and those ultimately that we as leaders are called to serve and love and guide. Um, so first, I always start with definitions, right? To be clear of what we're talking about in this moment, because we know that there are a variety of ways that things are defined. So again, when I talk about radical, I'm talking about that which rejects all of those things that have been oppressive, especially for Black, Indigenous, people of color, because we know if it's oppressive for us, that it's impressive, oppressive for those within the dominant culture. And secondly, I talk about the def definition that I use for love. So I am a uh, romantic at heart. And when I say I'm a romantic, I'm not just a romantic in terms of intimate relationship and falling in love and being in love. I'm a romantic because I really do believe that love, not as an emotion or a sentimentality, but as an active force can truly change us all. And so I define love as a life-giving force that creates that liberates and that sustains, honoring the humanity of all while seeking justice and compassion. Again, I define love as a life-giving force that creates, that liberates, that sustains, honoring the humanity of all while seeking justice and compassion. So I wanna take a moment just for you to drop, drop in the chat. When you hear that definition of love, or as you think about how you define love in your own life, um, what comes up for you? What has been, or how have you thought about love and how do you think about love when you hear it? Because truth be told, a lot of folks that I first work with, um, both as a coach and as a consultant are like, when you say love, what are you talking about? And we get into kind of the, the nitty gritty of it. So. What do you think, not only about that definition, but how do you understand love? And again, thank you for um, what you're sharing in the chats for the, the amazing definition. Thank you. And again, welcome to those who are here from um, all over Greenville, Alabama. Thank you for being here. But when you hear that definition of love, or when you think about love, what comes up for you? And please feel free to drop that in the chat. Latanya says, love for me is that which brings about the flourishing of life. Absolutely. Right. And again, even in your definition, that which brings about the flourishing of life is an actual force. Right. It's not just emotion. It's not just sentiment. It's not just a feeling. It's something that creates and in uh, Latanya's understanding, something that creates flourishing. So love as an unconditional expression of care. Thank you, Chuck, right? Like how we express what we feel, again, as a verb, as an action, is so critical and so important. And so we're going to be talking again about love and radical love and self-love. And I didn't call it self-care precisely because of what we heard in our um, morning presentation, right? We have connected self-care, conflated self-care with merely the aesthetic, the exterior, right? So when leaders talk about self-care, when you hear about it, I think a lot of times what comes up is you want me to take more time or spend more money to do stuff for my external. Um, what we're going to talk about today, again, is radical self-love. So that which actually rejects anything that's oppressive and is life-giving creative, liberating, sustaining, and honors our holistic humanity. 
So one of the things I'd like to do first, which again, is gonna be kind of odd, but we're gonna just rock with it. We're gonna do it, we're gonna figure it out. Um, I often begin with meditation, right? So in addition to being a theologian, um, a writer, a coach consultant, I also do work in energy healing. And one of the things that I absolutely love about that particular medium of care is that it allows us to really get in touch with what we're feeling, right? And with what we're thinking and with how we're doing in our physical form, in our bodies. And that's the first step, right? When we talk about creating this roadmap to radical self-love for leaders, the first step is to get in touch with what you're being, your mind, heart, body, and soul, the totality of who you are with what your being is trying to communicate with you. So I'm going to lead you in this moment in a guided visualization. Now, this should be interesting because I can't see you. I can't tell if you're doing this. So I'm gonna trust that you're going to embrace this moment. I hope you're in a space where you're seated and you're comfortable or as comfortable as you can be. Um, in this moment, and hopefully you have some modicum of both privacy and stillness around you. But I'd like for you just to get comfortable. And I'm going to keep my eyes open right now because for me, then it's like I'm here with you still. But we're going to take some deep breaths, right? The first thing that we do is we become mindful of the breath of spirit, right? Of the rook of God that is moving through us that reminds us as long as we're breathing, we're being, and there's still more loving to be done. So let's take a few deep breaths. We're going to breathe in through our nose and breathe out through your mouth. Again, breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth. One more time, breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth. And if you're comfortable, I invite you to close your eyes and just pay attention to your breath, okay? And with your eyes closed, I want you to imagine that you are standing before a body of water. Any body of water that comes to mind and actually the first body of water that comes to mind. I want you to picture it and I want you to see it and notice it. Is it an ocean or a stream? Is it a river or a lake or a pond or a waterfall? Right? I just want you to take in this body of water, paying attention to what you hear as you are beholding this body of water. And as you're looking and taking in this body of water, as you're looking at this body of water, I want you to pay attention to the movement of the water. Is the water moving? Is it still? Is it rushing or flowing? Are there waves? Maybe there's some ripples. What movement do you discern is happening? in this body of water. And I want you to take a step closer to the body of water. Really look at it. Notice the movement. And now I want you to pay attention to things that you see either in the water or maybe floating on the surface of the water. Are there leaves? Are there limbs? Maybe they're fish. Maybe there's some seaweed or moss. What are you seeing in the water? And as you look at the water or in the water, is it clear? Is it murky? 
right? I really want you to imagine this body of water and its movement and what's in it. And keep breathing. Now I want you to actually get in the water. Right? I want you to place your body physically in the water. When you do that, what does your body feel? How does your body feel as you actually get in the water? And are you stepping into the water? Are you jumping in the water? Are you diving in the water? And just pay attention to your body in the water. And continue to breathe and notice the movement and the sounds and the things that might be in the water. And also what you're doing. And I want you to remember that historical ways of being would have us only think that there are two things that we can do in the water. We can either sink or swim. But the reality is, is that we can float, we can tread water, we can simply be. And I'm going to invite us now to take three deep breaths together and come back to this moment. So breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Again, a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. One more breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. And I want you to first and foremost thank yourself for taking this time right, to simply be in your body. And I'm curious if you could share in the chat, how did that feel for you? What was your experience in that meditation? What was your experience in that meditation? How did that feel for you? And as folks are considering those thoughts, we have some more definitions around love, around liberation without conditions. Love, as learned in church as a child, is seeking the best good for the object of concern and a spirit of self-sacrifice, regardless of feelings. Those are amazing. Those are beautiful. How was that meditation for you and what came up for you? I like to start with that guided visualization because I use that as a metaphor, right? So thank you, Jacqueline. She shared very calming and in tune with floating in the rushing water, right? I love that. But I use that as a metaphor, right? So the water represents our deepest sense of knowing. I didn't have to necessarily tell you what kind of water or what the body of water was. I gave you some examples of what it could be, but your mind knew what the water was, right? And it's not even just your mind. I talk about that as the soul, right? The spirit. I'm actually holding my gut right now. But that that deep sense of knowing where I don't have to tell you anything, but you know. So part of this, the importance of checking in with ourselves, whether it's meditation, centering prayer, time to simply be, is to understand that we know some things. Our spirit knows some things. So the water represents your knowing, right? You have the capacity to understand and make meaning of things without me even leading that with you. Secondly, when we talk about the body of water and the movement of the water, I actually connect the movement of the water to our heart, to our emotional center, right? So again, how you feel a lot of times comes up in what the water is doing. So if the water is churning, if the water is still, if the water is waves, right, that connects to our feelings. And when we sit with that for a moment, it also has something to communicate to us. 
then we talk about the things that are in or on the water, right? It could be a school of fish or it could be, um, what is that, like moss? Like I had an image of at a lake when there's some moss at the bottom that's just kind of going back and forth. That represents our thoughts, right? So whatever is in the water or on the water represents your thoughts. And it could be many right? It could be maybe you have some leaves if you're thinking of a lake, maybe if you're in an ocean, you're seeing fish, but it could be many or it could be few. But again, recognizing what's coming up in your mind with your thoughts. And then lastly, the body, right? When you get into the water or how you get into the water also connects to how your body is feeling and doing. Um, we don't spend enough time listening to our bodies. And in this season, I've reclaimed pra both practices of yoga and meditation. And if I'm honest, I really dislike yoga. And the reason I dislike yoga is because yoga is one form of movement that actually shows me my capacity all the time right? I'm confronted with my capacity. And because I'm a recovering perfectionist, I'm di divesting from being productive and always having to do, right? Yoga is the thing that I now engage in that reminds me that I don't have to do, I simply have to be, right? I have to hold a movement or a stretch and breathe into it. And in that moment, I'm reminded of all of these things because my body is communicating with me. So again, that engagement in the water and how your body enters the water gives you some insight into how your body is feeling. Um, so when I talk about leaders engaging this journey of radical self-love, it first begins with knowing, with knowing how you're feeling, with knowing what you're thinking, with knowing what is um, swirling within you. Um, I often say that we cannot lead well if we're not first well, right? So in order to lead well, we have to first be well. And one of the things that I notice, um, I coach leaders, um, faith leaders, nonprofit leaders, executives, a lot of us aren't well. And I'm not saying that in a judgmental way. I'm saying that from a standpoint of our wellness has not been tended to because we are overly concerned with and have been told the lie that it more on others than we are in some way living out this call to leadership. And the reality is, is that especially when I go back to scripture as someone of the Christian tradition, I see a leader in Jesus that first tends to himself, that first takes time Again, the first thing that we see Jesus doing when he begins his public ministry is to go off in the desert, in the wilderness, to be with himself, right? To engage in moments of reflection and renewal. And that same is true um, during out the course of his, throughout the course of his ministry. We see him taking time to pray, to rest, to be alone, and then engaging the work that's before him, always recognizing who the work is for, right? Always pointing back to the one who sent him and being mindful of the humanity of those he sent. So when we talk about leading and self-love, I'm not talking about being so turned in on oneself, right? Um, I'm Lutheran and so Martin Luther would say in Curvatus and say that we're so curved in on ourselves that we're not able to be of service to others. What I'm talking about is dropping deeper into self so that we are able to more fully and holistically support others. So let's see what, what, what you all share. Thank you for sharing. This is exciting. Like, I'm glad that I'm not just talking in a vacuum. <laughs> um, but we hear folks talked about um, experiencing a familiar tranquility. Oh, thank God for that, right? I saw what I was wearing, the waves coming in and out, the feel of the water over my feet with the squish of sand between my toes and then going further in. Oh, Monica, I think I'm going to head to the beach pretty soon because that is exactly what I want to feel, right? Um, freeing and being able to do what I choose to do in the water. And guess what? We have choice. We have agency. One of the lies that I hear us repeat all the time is I have to. And a lot of times I question, well, what is the have to and who told you you have to? And also, even in that way of thinking, I have to, 
it seems constricting. What are you being invited to do, right? What are you being offered? What is offered to you because of who you are? So a lot of the work that I do with clients is really about reframing, right? Reframing from that which is oppressive to that which is life-giving. So Carolyn said it was freeing and being able to do what I choose. Okay, I read that. Oh, not limited to sink or swim, not moved by what's around me. It was calming and relaxing that you faced your fear. All right, Janice. Um, Latanya saw a lake, lots of death and life. I love it, right? And that is the cycle of life, but also saw turtles and fish and ducks and insects. My body felt completely free and relaxed. Oh, I see a few of us that are perfectionists, recovering perfectionists, which I believe is a, a lie of white supremacy, a lie of whiteness. Um, perfectionism is never a thing that our, if we're people of Christian faith, that our faith story invites us to. We're only invited to faithfulness, right? We're never invited to getting things right. We're invited to be faithful, and that is something in my own life that I have been meditating on and sitting with and engaging as I wonder what it means to lead in this time. So, so thank you for engaging that practice with me because the first thing in radical self-love, right, is to know, is to engage what you're thinking, feeling, and how your body is doing, right? The second thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is the order in which we understand um, how things come up in us. So I'm also someone who lives with major uh, depressive disorder and anxiety, and I'm on medication for that. And I've been very open about that as a part of my own um, coming of age story and also as a leader. Like I'm one who lives with mental illness and I utilize all sorts of methods and tools to um, create wellness, right? Because it's not for me necessarily about healing, it's about me being well right? Because I might live with depression my entire life based on my chemistry, based on my ancestry, just based on things that are true biologically about me. And in the midst of living with a chronic illness, I can also create wellness, right? Um, and so one of the things that I've been learning in that, that journey is to embrace the shadow, right? Embrace the part of myself that the world would tell me is something that I need to be ashamed of or something I should not share, right? So the first thing that I invited you to do was to get in touch with what you're feeling, what you're knowing, what is true about yourself in this moment. The second thing I invite you to, and I always invite leaders to on the self-love journey, is to embrace, right, your shadow. Embrace those parts of yourself that um, have been hidden or have been told that they were not good enough or that they were defective. Um, I think that when we don't embrace our shadow, and I think we all probably have seen this, if it's not happened to us personally, we've seen it happen to others, our shadow overtakes us, right? Maladaptive behaviors, ways of being and thinking, um, our behaviors, right, kind of eke out the dis-ease or the unhealth. And so the way that I have learned to combat that is to fully confront it, to say, this is the truth of who I am and I am actively working on my wellness, right? So you embrace the shadow parts of yourself. And, and I often have to be very clear when I talk about this because I think that as leaders, right, whether it's fair or not, we are put in positions of, you know, we're put on pedestals, whether that's what we want or not. Um, we are we are in the light, right? People look to us. And I think for so long, um, the role of leader has been understood to be to present a put together way of being. And the reality is that, again, that where do we see that in scripture? The leaders, the disciples or the, uh, the Hebrew scripture folks, none of them had a put together experience or existence right? And God tended to call the ones that had the rough and ragged or jagged edges, not because God was then using them to make them fully clean or fully perfect, right? But God was using them and showing that in the midst of all of who they were, they were still worthy. They were a worthy vessel of the gospel, of the message of hope and liberation and redemption. And I think the work of the people 
was then to embrace who they were, but also seek out that wellness, right? So it's not that I want people to continue to live in places of suffering or struggle, or if you're not healthy, to do things that, that again, filter out to your community in ways that cause hurt and pain. What I'm saying is you're honest with yourself and then you seek out that which you need to be well, right? So the second part of this um, self-love, radical self-love for leaders is around embracing your shadow. And again, we're reclaiming our humanity. So when we talk about what's radical, we're rejecting that which has been oppressive. So an oppressive practice has been to stuff down, ignore, turn away from the issues, struggles, problems you have. I mean, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a house that um, even though my parents were very supportive and loving, therapy was not a thing. You didn't talk about your issues outside the house. You kept it quiet. And even 11 years ago, when I became public with my own mental health struggles, one of the first things my father said to me was, this is going to affect your job. It's going to affect your livelihood. It could be used against you. And that was his, his concern, but also it was his fear right? So there is this fear that underlies it that says that if you do this, you won't be accepted. And part of the radical self-love is to say, I'm already accepted. I'm already worthy. I am stepping more fully into my truth and into the being that God has created me to be. The third thing that I would share, right? So we first did a meditation, which was the actual practice that I'm, I'm sharing with you to do yourself, but the practice of getting in touch with how you're feeling. The second is to, to embrace the shadow parts of yourself. Um, the third thing that I would say is to lean into, right? A way of being that is marked by love and abundance rather than the way of being marked by fear and scarcity, right? We're leaning into a way of being marked by love and abundance rather than leaning into or living by a way of being marked by fear and scarcity. So as I've mentioned that, as I talk about fear and scarcity, what are some ways of being or thoughts you've had or things you've experienced that were marked by fear and scarcity, right? What are some ways of being, thoughts you've had, things you've experienced that were marked by fear and scarcity. So that's a question I'm asking for you and you can definitely respond in the chat. But what are some ways of being, um, things you've experienced, things you've, you've done or said that have been marked by fear and scarcity? And I can share one of mine was when I first um, left my, my former role. So I was the director for young adults ministry for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. So one of the largest Protestant denominations here in the US, um, I, was basically a superstar in my denomination, right? Rising the proverbial ranks, which is a whole issue within itself. As we think about rising or climbing a ladder, we have to think about where that metaphor comes from. And um, was good at my job. And I also was starting to recognize as being a black leader in a primarily white institution, that there was a, a cognitive dissonance that I could no longer live with, right? Um, and it was literally soul crushing. And so I made the decision to leave, to leave my job, um, to walk away from it all. Um, I was living in Chicago at the time, but I knew that I was being called home and not just home as the place of Houston, but being called home to the place that nurtured me, that um, provided my rootedness and centeredness because I had missed that in that time. And when I came home and I thought about starting a business, the fear that I had, right, the voice in my head was, there is no way that you need to start a coaching or consulting business for leaders. Like everyone does that. There's so many that are out there. Um, you know, I think about that now with the podcast that I'm starting, there are a million or so podcasts. Why would you do that? Like, and even that thinking, right. It was marked by not only fear, but scarcity. There's a limited amount of whatever and only X amount of people can provide that limited amount of whatever because otherwise um, there just isn't enough, right? And so having to constantly combat this scarcity thinking that I never realized how intrinsic it was to who I am and leaning into abundance to say, there is enough. Actually, there's more than enough. And if this vision has been planted on my heart, mind, and spirit, then it's something that God will see through 
with my effort, right? Like if I give the effort and I show up and I'm faithful, again, being faithful to whatever the call is and lean into the abundance, things will be different. So, um, oh, thank you, LaTanya, for sharing. My own journey and struggle to deal with recurrent pregnancy loss fooled me into believing my body was broken and deficient. Your body is not broken and deficient, right? You are amazing. Your body is amazing. And there are things and struggles that we have um, that maybe we don't know in the moment why it is. And I'm not saying anything, hopefully, to take away from the real struggle and the sadness of wanting to, to bear a child. Um, but your body is not deficient or broken, right? And Latanya, I don't know if you listen to um, Tank and the Bangas, but they have a song called Human. And I listen to that as part of my morning meditation every morning. And it talks about how my body is beautiful, right? And I'll type that in the chat. Um, and it's just called human. Yeah, right? So um, yeah, as you think about this, other examples or things that you have um, been telling yourself, right, or this way of being that you've embodied that leans more into fear and scarcity than love and abundance. That is something that we as leaders have to root out in ourselves because it's so pervasive in our society. And even subconsciously, there are moments when I see us leading in that way and speaking in that way with those that we are serving. So again, on this, this, this roadmap for um, nurturing radical self-love for yourself, you know, getting in touch with who you are, with your being, with your knowing. Number two, um, we talked about, um, oh man, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Honoring yourself, being in touch with who you are, embracing your shadow, right? And, and moving from fear and scarcity to love and abundance thinking. Um, we have a question. How do leaders keep from perpetuating and sometimes feeding into leaders being placed on a pedestal? That is an excellent question. You know, and on the one hand, I say that we have to constantly articulate that we're human, but it's not just in what we say, it's on what we do, right? So what are the stories that we share with our communities that um, express our humanness? And also, how are we creating space for people's humanity to be shared in the moment. I used to always tell the story of when I was serving in a congregation in Atlanta, I would be up on the balcony, um, like in the atrium area where we would do like in between services, our coffee hour or whatever. And I'd be standing up there sometimes talking to one of my colleagues and just kind of looking out over the atrium. And I would be like, man, I wish so-and-so would talk to so-and-so because they both have experienced miscarriages recently. Or I wish so-and-so would talk to so-and-so because both of their, they both have teenage um, sons who are dealing with depression. Or I wish so-and-so would talk to so-and-so because they're both going through difficult divorces or situations with their marriages. And I knew this as the leader, right? But I couldn't like tell them, I couldn't bring them to each other. Though I would often say like, you're not the only one, you're not the only one, your story is, is, um, is not odd, like there are other people here. And so one of the ways that we deal with that was to start to create spaces where people could identify themselves to come together to talk about whatever that difficult topic was, right? So then it was not a surprise to me when we had over 15, you know, women show up when I started talking about miscarriages or using the pulpit to talk about the the pressure of being a woman and maybe your body not working in ways that we've been taught it's supposed to work. And, and so first I give voice to that, right? Especially from the pulpit or especially from whatever situation or space of leadership that I hold. And then I invite um, or curate space. And maybe it's not just me, maybe I have some other leaders that are able to do that, right? Especially if it's an issue or topic that may not be as personal to me or as um, something that I would have experience with. But creating those, those spaces where people are able to again reclaim their humanity and you live in a way that shows that you're reclaiming your humanity starts to, to shift, right? This leader on a pedestal who does no wrong, right? I'm not against leaders being models of some sorts. Like, I think that that's important. And I think that, you know, we are, as Christians, we're, we're, 
we follow Jesus, we are called to live cruciform lives, right? So I think that there's something about the modeling, but I don't know where the perfectionism came with that. Because again, that's not something I see in scripture. And I'm also not Jesus, right? Like we're disciples. And so if you hold to the belief that Jesus was perfect, um, we're not Jesus and we're not called to be perfect. Um, but there's a part of me that leans more into Jesus's humanity. So I'm more interested in what Jesus was doing when we weren't reading about him as well. Um, but we're human and we have to fully reclaim our humanity and share our stories. So I think it is, was it Maria? I hope that that um, at least goes to, to some of the question that you asked, but if others have responses to that question, please drop them in the chat. So she asked, or they asked, I'm sorry, I, I don't know pronouns and I should ask that first, but how do leaders keep from perpetuating and sometimes feeding into leaders being placed on a pedestal? So if you have some answers for that, please share that in the chat. Um, and then the fourth thing I would say, right, in the reclamation of our humanity on this journey of radical self-love for leaders. So we talked about um, getting in touch with, with who we are, with what we're feeling, with what we're thinking. We talked about embracing our shadow. We talked about moving from scarcity and fear to abundance and love. And then the last thing that I would share is really engaging practices, practices that open us up to not only what the spirit is doing, but also to our own power, right? So practices that open us up to what the spirit is doing and also to our own power. Um, I am not a disciplined person. I really struggle with self-discipline, like so much so that now I have removed my phone charger from next to my bed to put it across the room um, because I have no self-control, right? And what I've had to do is create practices that create the environment um, for me to do the things that I want to do, right? So I want to be someone who meditates, does yoga, and journals um, before I engage work. And I'm not even going to say first thing in the morning because I'm not really a morning person. Like this is the first time I've been up. I was up at seven o'clock this morning and I just don't subscribe or ascribe to this whole the early bird gets the worm thing. I think that you get the worm when you honor your body's rhythms and when you um, know who you are. So I'm definitely a later morning into the day into the evening person. But one of the things that I've recognized is that I have to create or practice engage practices that nurture the outcome that I want, right? So when I take the time to get up, get my water, have my 15 minute meditation, do a 20 to 30 minute yoga practice and journal, that first hour of my time up changes my entire day, my entire day. And it, it's not even that I'm necessarily more productive as much as it's that I am more centered, I am grounded in a way that I have not been if I don't do those things, right? So part of this, um, the radical self-love is engaging in practices that help you ground or be grounded, that help you center. So I'd love for you to drop in the chat, what are some practices that you do? What are the things that you engage to help you center? and to be grounded, right? Um, and sometimes the, the beautiful part of that is you get to explore. So going back to when I, you know, my mental health, um, I'm, I'm divorced and when I was going through my separation at that point I was living in Atlanta um, and I would go, part of my, my care was to go to a Buddhist temple and do met group sitting meditation, right? So I would go, and at this point I was going at 6 a.m. So I was a different person. I mean, this was more than 10 years ago, a totally different person, younger, willing to get up early, all those great things. Um, and it was a practice that helped me get in touch with what I was feeling and thinking. And, and to be clear, the, the meditation started after I was on my, my meds for a while because to sit and ruminate when you're not well and when your mind is, is 
either suicidal or in dark places is 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 not advised but in that moment as a part of my own care i was seeing my therapist i was um, working on my meds i was also exercising at that point um, i was going and doing sitting meditation and it was such a powerful experience right and so i know when i'm off center um, when i feel um, untethered right and when I have not been engaging practices that are life-giving, practices that are, excuse me, creative, practices that bring about liberation, practices that sustain me. Again, going back to this definition of love, those practices are integral to us leading well, but more importantly, those practices are integral to us showing ourselves, our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and our spirits that we are worthy of the time, right? And sometimes I get frustrated with myself because on all told, my morning, that routine that I talked about, so getting up, meditating, yoga, journaling, takes an hour. Like it literally takes an hour of my day. And there are moments when I struggle to do it. And so part of my own journey of self-discipline has been to say, I would do this for someone else, right? I would show up if, if anyone in my life needed me to show up immediately, or if anyone that I was serving when I used to work in a congregation needed something, I would drop whatever I was doing to go be with them. And a lot of times I wouldn't have done the work to care for myself first. And for those of us who are faith leaders and really believe in the power of energy and spirit, the reality is if we're not rooted and grounded, if we haven't taken the time to dive into the divine source, we're gonna be pouring out of a dry well. We're gonna be taking things that are not ours to give because we haven't done the work to sit and receive and reflect and be renewed for the journey ahead, right? So again, I haven't talked anything about massages and pedicures and all of that stuff, which I also love because that's not the thing, right? The thing is, what is the thing that centers and grounds us? So we see people, Monica said that candles, journaling, music, yes. Um, Carolyn, centering prayer, early morning prayer and meditation, journaling, music, yes, right? Um, not too long ago, I love to color. Like I have, an, I actually have an adult coloring book and I'm sorry if there's some real sanctified people here, but I curse a lot. So my friends bought me a, a coloring book of adult curse words and it's like, beautiful calligraphy, right? And there are moments when I put on my music and I just sit in color and I'm able to like just be present. Music, thank you, is a, another huge tool. I have meditation song list. I have love and light playlist. I have inspiration playlist, right? And so the practices um, are really important for us as we engage this. And I'm realizing, I don't know what time I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> So um, <laughs> I think we might be coming up on time. And so, um, but I do want to say that these four things, right? Um, spending time getting to know how you're th thinking, what you're feeling, embracing your shadow, leaning into abundance um, and love rather than believing the lie of fear and scarcity and engaging or developing practices that center and ground you are the roadmap for nurturing radical self-love. And this work does not go to waste. This work reaps benefits that we can't even imagine. The renewal that we experience, the, the inspiration, right? When I am engaging that which is creative, oh my gosh, like it, it literally blows my mind with then how that pays off in my ministry work or in the, the work that I do as a consultant. And so um, do you have questions, please? If you have questions, comments, concerns, drop them in the chat. Um, and thank you so much for engaging. Yes, coloring is so therapeutic. Taking a walk, walks are great, right? Like going out and just moving your body. Um, I'm in Texas, you know, my parents have a pool and I live in a community with a pool. And, and in this time of COVID, I've been going in the water, like, and, and swimming, not just sitting, but swimming in the water, um, lounging in the water, being in the water, um, all of this. And so just a few, I guess, last minute reminders um, again, my name is Rosella Ide White. I am known as the Love Big Coach. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Rosella HW. 
um, on Facebook at Rosella H. White, um, the Love Big Coach, and I am the author of Love Big, The Power of Revolutionary Relationships to Heal the World. You can get it anywhere that books are sold. You can just search for Rosella White. Um, and I also have a community called the Love Big Collective. Um, it's a newsletter community where I share weekly um, love notes with folks and self-love Sunday tips, but it's about people who are wanting to nurture life-giving and justice-seeking love within themselves for the sake of the world. Um, and lastly, I'm a coach. I love working with leaders. I offer spiritual life coaching, leadership coaching, job transition coaching, and then a new project for white folks called Racial Healing and Wellness Coaching. Um, but I'd love to connect with you. Again, you can find me online. RosellaHWhite.com is my website. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? I'll drop some stuff in the chat. Yep. So here we go. That's my website. And then Twitter and Instagram are the same. And it's at Rosella HW. And then Facebook is at Rosella H. White. And I am your love big coach. And then the Love Big Collective can be found at lovebig.substack.com. Chris, you can access my definition of love in my book. <laughs> but also, I'll share it here as well. So love is, I define love as a life-giving force that creates, liberates. And in the book, I talk about what... Um, inspired that and it really was the trinity right so this notion of um god being in relationship with god's self as the very first act of self-love and in the trinity we see a god that is creative that is liberative and that is sustaining right so my book starts with that um conversation around what informs it liberates uh and sustains us honoring our humanity and seeking collective compassion and justice. Okay, yes, I dropped that in the chat as well. So thank you all so much. Seriously, this has been a pleasure. I wish I could see your faces. I do miss Zoom because I like being able to see folks and putting names and faces um, together. But I hope to connect with you on the interwebs, especially in this time of, of COVID and Corona. And I hope you're staying safe. And I also hope that you are actively pushing back against anything that is oppressive. Um, I honestly believe that God wants only that which is life-giving for us. And as a womanist, I believe that um, suffering is not necessarily redemptive. I believe that while our suffering um, can teach us things, right, God um, ultimately wants our flourishing, our thriving, and us to revel in the abundance that God has created of not only creation, but of love. So I love you so much. And thank you for this 